Colleagues, good afternoon, and welcome back to the press briefing from the Palace of the President in Jakarta. During this pandemic, food security is one of the key concerns of all governments, including the government of Indonesia. The FAO, in a joint statement with WTO and WHO on the 31st of March, reminded all of us on the potential food shortages in the global market if countries fail to manage the continuing outbreak properly. Today, the Minister of Agriculture, Pa Shahrul Yassin Limpo, will brief you on the government's effort in safeguarding food security in Indonesia. Professor Wiku is also with us today to respond questions related to technical and details issues of COVID-19. So thank you very much, Minister Shahrul Yassin Limpo and Professor Wiku. Colleagues, let me first brief you on the status of the Indonesian returnees per 3rd June 2020. In total, as per yesterday, more than 100,000 Indonesian, or to be more exact, 107,650, has returned home, an increase of 3,876 within a week. Between 18 March until 3rd of June, 80,204 Indonesian have returned from Malaysia. This is an increase of 1,158 compared to last week. Meanwhile, 20,637 Indonesian crews have returned from 25 countries, arriving in Indonesia through dedicated entry points in Jakarta and Bali. This is an increase of 2,000 381 compared to last week. 8,809 Indonesian have returned home via self-repatriation. I repeat, via self-repatriation from 38 countries. This is an increase of 337 compared to last week. Also, we continue to extend assistance to Indonesian abroad where are in need. Between 18 March until 3rd of June, in Malaysia alone, our embassies have distributed, it's not only embassies, but our mission in Malaysia have contributed 285,000, 285,200, and 56 packages of basic needs. And with the help of the Indonesian diaspora, we managed to provide 394,424 packages in total in Malaysia. And this brings our total assistance globally to 458,600 17. I repeat, 458,617 packages, that is including in the Middle East, Asia Pacific, Europe, America, and Africa. With the large number of Indonesian returnees, health protocol continue to be strictly upheld to pre prevent imported cases. As you may also follow, Despite challenges that Indonesia faces, there are some positive progress in the tackling of COVID-19 in some provinces, such as in West Java and Bali. In West Java, for example, this is just an example, on the 20th of May, there were 169 cases. And on the 3rd of June, the cases have decreased to five cases. So you can compare in West Java on the 20th of May, 
169, and then on the, thir the 3rd of June, only five cases. In Bali, for example, another example, on the 29th of May, there were 23 cases, and by 3rd of June, it decreased to only three cases. Furthermore, there are also, we are also seeing 11 provinces with zero new cases, namely Aceh, Bengkulu, Yogyakarta, Jambi, North Kalimantan, Rio Islands, Lampung, West Papua, West Sulawesi, and East Nusa Tenggara. The province of Jakarta also show a very positive progress. So this positive progress are just a few examples and our effort toward flattening the curve in Indonesia and hopefully can serve as example for other regions on the necessary measures to suppress the spread of COVID-19. Colleagues, my second issue, yesterday I had three phone calls with Foreign Minister of Maldives, Egypt, and the Netherlands. Issues discussed during the phone calls, among others, include first, and of course, we compare notes on where we are right now on our effort to fight against the virus. At the same time, we also compare notes on effort to reduce economic impact of the virus and preparation of the new normal. Second issue that I discussed with them, I flag again the issue of vaccine and medicine. I re-emphasize the need to ensure equitable and access to affordable COVID-19 treatments and vaccine. Third, on Palestine issue, following up my letter to Foreign Minister colleagues last week, I re-emphasize the importance of international support, international support for Palestine, particularly to prevent Israel's plans of annexation of the West Bank. Fourth, we are glad that our cooperation on repatriation of our national have been very constructive. Colleagues, my third update is regarding activities related to the Foreign Policy and Global Health Initiative, or FPGH under the presidency of Indonesia in 2020. So this year, Indonesia is the president for FPGH. As mentioned in my previous briefing, the theme of Indonesia presidency is affordable health care for all. On the 1st June 2020, Indonesia hosted the meeting of national health insurance agencies and equivalent institution. Chaired by the CEO of BPGS Kesehatan, the meeting exchanged best practices and experiences on universal health coverage or UHC and affordable health care for all. Exchange of views also on features and role of social security agencies of FPGH countries in providing financial risk protection for health expenditure. And as the outcome of the meeting, the chair's summary highlighted the importance of cooperation between key players in the health sector to attain, to attain universal health coverage as envisioned by the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Prominent points highlighted in the chair's summary include the need to support cooperation to ensure accessibility of affordable health care for, uh, sorry, I repeat it again. The need to support future cooperation to ensure accessibility of affordable health care in cooperation with civil society and private sectors. And then identify avenues for future cooperation 
among National Health Insurance Organization of FPGH member countries on sustainable management of social security for health and the FPGH members also share experiences on the role of national health insurance administrators in responding the current pandemic and in anticipating the possibility of future health crisis. This meeting was also convened as part of the events leading up to the upcoming FPGH Joint Ministerial Virtual Meeting scheduled on the 26th, June 2020. Invitation for the meeting have been conveyed to foreign ministers and health ministers of FPGH member countries. Amidst commit COVID-19 pandemic, synergy between synergy between global health and foreign policy issues is now more pertinent than ever. And I do hope that FPGH will be able to deliver tangible outcomes to contribute to the mitigation of COVID-19, particularly in ensuring equitable access to affordable treatment and vaccine. So colleagues, that is all from me. And now uh, allow me to invite Minister Limpo to convey some updates on safeguarding food security in Indonesia during the COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic. So Minister Limpo, the floor is yours. And thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon. May peace be upon us. Excellency Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, friends of the media, ladies and gentlemen, today I wish to continue what has been conveyed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs particularly on the agricultural sector policies and food security amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, I will not repeat what the Minister has said, but in principle, the President of the Republic of Indonesia in many occasions and in many meetings have provided a special attention that the COVID-19 pandemic have Apart from finding a medical solution, it is also important for us to accelerate and other things related to food security. It is part and parcel of the national strategy that we have to maintain. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, from the policies of uh, COVID against COVID-19. There are some signs that we have to be looked at based on the advice from the FAO that post-pandemic there is a possibility of a food security due to the length of the uh, dry season. And apart from that, and a uh, five uh, yearly uh, of tax to crops, especially in Southeast Asian countries, particularly Indonesia, and based on the policies by the president to anticipate those issues, we have 11 basic food products, which is becoming our main concern to maintain 
in the national uh, food security. And those are rice, corn, shallots, garlic, red chili, red eye chili, beef, chicken, egg, sugar, and cooking oil. And during a peak season, the use of these basic food supplies are during the Ramadan month and also the Idul Fitri festivities, which is a big festivity in Indonesia. And we have passed through that period. And in short, I would also like to convey that we have three crop, three planting seasons in a yearly circus. And our first cycle of planting season is ongoing and from October to March and October is October 2019 through March 2020 we have produced 6 million hectares of plants and until March we have 16 million tons of rice and the needs for rice is 15 million tons so our final stock in June we have at least 7.49 tons million tons of rice and this is the final stock that is carried over throughout 2019 in which we have a remaining 5 million tons so till today we have the remaining stock from last year and we have 7 million tons of supplies and now we are in a phase of a second phase of the planting season and a total of fields that we have is 7.9 million hectares and that is carried over at this moment now we have 7.4 million tons in June so now we are in the planting season from June to, June to September and the production is 5.6 million hectares of production and we are expecting to have 8.5 tons 5, 8.5 million tons of production and from June is 7.49 million tons of rice and this means that we have a final stock of 8.5 million tons of rice therefore during the June to September planting season we will continue to strengthen it and we will accelerate uh, many things so that the warning from FAO on the dry season can be overcome and within June rain season we are aiming to produce 8.5 million tons of rice therefore we have no doubt that we can get through all this we have an emergency agenda a temporary agenda and we also have a permanent agenda I wish to point out that those approach we have some alternative plans if everything is beyond our prediction and we will also use a swamp based on the guidance from Mr. President that we can utilize the waters in the swamps and we have 160,000 hectares of lands that we can intensify which we can produce 500,000 tons of rice and we have that in central Kalimantan the second way or the second anticipation is that we will diversify our local food products for instance in Papua in Maluku we have sagu 
and also some in some places like in East Java and also uh, bananas, we will use those alternatives to diversify our uh, food products. And the third plan of anticipation is we are going to make use of the uh, reserves in the provincial area to fulfill the demands in the provinces. We have 516 regencies and towns and cities. This is to also absorb all the impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, as this has been mentioned by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, so that it will so that we can avoid a disruption to economic activities in Indonesia and also we have to ensure the proper distribution of economic activities and distribution of food in several areas, therefore that we can mitigate the economic impacts by continuing to provide uh, food supplies by utilizing the stocks, uh, stocks of the provincial areas. The final guidance by the president, that we have to provide stimulus to farmers. We have poor farmers that we have to provide stimulus to. And we have to prioritize them to help them and support for 2.7 million people. We provide them seeds and fertilizers and also medicines to ensure that they can carry out their own activities. With regards to poor farmers, we will also utilize the use of family farming using residential lands, using residential lands. The number is big. If this intervention can be done, therefore, all of the efforts to strengthen the national food logistics can be fulfilled by the residential plantings and plantation. Therefore, we have got through the momentum of Ramadan and also Idul Fitri, where traditionally there is a hike in consumption and we can carry out the stabilization of price and also the supply and also the stocks of food in various areas have been able to be maintained. Therefore, we hope that in 2021, February, our prognosis is that we can also anticipate and also uh, fulfill the needs. And these are the points that I wish to share, the Minister, on the food security from what we have anticipated. We hope that we can do our job well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pa Shahrul. Thank you very much, Minister Limpo. Colleagues, uh, let us proceed now to the uh, Q&A session. We have received questions from Aid Media, Moroccan Press Agency, Nikkei, Economic Daily, NHK, People Daily, Manichi Simbun, Sydney Morning Herald, Channel News Asia. Minister Limpo, of course, will answer questions related to the government's effort in safeguarding food security in Indonesia, while Pabiku will provide updates on technical data and details. Allow me now to answer question related to my portfolio. My first response is for question from Moroccan Press Agency in regard to the latest development of international cooperation for COVID-19 mitigation. To date, Indonesia has collaborated with 116 116 international partners comprising of 11 countries, 
12 international organizations and 93 NGOs. We have also facilitated international business to business support for 15 entities. Last week, I mentioned that one Indonesian company on the 27th of May had passed laboratory tests for certification of ISO 16604, class 3, that is for the PPEs. And three days later, on the 30th of May, another Indonesian company passed the test and received certification of ISO 16604, class 2. That's again for PPEs. In responding to the question by Economic Daily on details of my recent phone conversation with the U.S. Secretary Mike Pompeo on COVID-19 cooperation, colleague, as I mentioned in my briefing last week, we discussed three issues. One is on the cooperation to fight COVID-19, second is on the Palestine issues, and the third is on the Afghanistan. On Indonesia-U.S. COVID cooperation, I compare notes with Secretary Pompeo on how we can collaborate to address this issue. We are all facing difficult situation, not only Indonesia and the US, but the whole world. We came to the conclusion that no one country can resolve these challenges alone. Therefore, collaboration is key. We also discuss our bilateral cooperation to meet our needs on medical equipment, that is including ventilators. I want, you to, I want to update you that the first batch of the U.S. ventilators is scheduled to be delivered to Indonesia in the first half of this month. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs will work with the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta in regard to details and dates of shipments of ventilators. Another important aspect of our cooperation is to ensure equitable access of affordable vaccines once it has been found, and the importance of U.S. leadership to drive this progress. In short, only through collaboration can we succeed to overcome this common enemy or challenges. In regard to the Moroccan press news agency's question on what measures are planned in Indonesia foreign policy for the implementation of new normal and the Hajj cancellation, we continue to follow discussion of other countries on ways to, adopt, to adapt the new normal and learn that each country has different perspectives based on their circumstances and stages. That is why there is no one-size-fits-all formula for the new normal. For Indonesia, as President Jokowi has repeatedly emphasized, health is our number one priority. Economic activities can carefully resume, but we must uphold strict health protocols. In the new normal, it is important to ensure a productive society that is safe from COVID-19 or a COVID-safe productive society. I myself always communicate with my colleagues on how we see the new normal going forward, how countries can best adapt to it, and on how the economy can start to be productive yet safe for the society. The government is currently making preparation and efforts to ensure all the above mentioned points. On hot cancellation, I believe this has been explained clearly by the Minister of Religion. Now I would like to respond to several questions in one cluster that is on the South China Sea, particularly 
on our diplomatic note to the United Nations and the Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIS, and, of course, on the COC, as raised by Mainichi uh, Simbun, Nikkei, People's Daily, Sydney Morning Herald. So, colleagues, in regard to the Indonesian position on the South China Sea, the position of Indonesia is crystal clear and consistent. I have responded to questions related to South China Sea in my previous briefing on the 6th of May, mostly on the principal position of Indonesia. On our diplomatic note to the UN, on the 26th of May 2020, Indonesia just wanted to reiterate its consistent position in response to China's claim address to the UN, which may affect Indonesia EEZ. The same position was also reflected in Indonesia diplomatic note to the UN on July 2010. What does it mean? It means that this kind of communication and its substantive content is not new at all. Again, this reflects that Indonesia holds a consistent position. Our diplomatic note to the UN on the 26th of May reiterated our objection, among others, to what so-called nine dash line or what so-called historic right. On that diplomatic note, Indonesia also called for full compliance toward UNCLOS 1982. With regard to China's plan to claim an air defense identification zone or ADIS, I have heard about this issue since 2015. However, I have yet to hear any official statement on this matter, so I cannot comment further. On the resumption of the COC, the Code of Conduct, Indonesia believes that conducive situation in the South China Sea can support the COC negotiation process. Therefore, we remain committed to continue our work in ensuring the conclusion of the COC that is effective, substantive, and actionable in line with UNCLOS 1982. My next response is for Nikkei on the question regarding Japan to join the new route of high-speed railway project potentially connecting Bandung and Surabaya. Colleagues, Jakarta-Bandung high-speed railway project is progressing. According to the Coordinating Ministry of Maritime and Investment, discussion have begun on the possible extension of this route to Surabaya and exploring potential consortium with other partners, including the possibility of Japan participation in the extension project. Japan is an important partner for Indonesia in the development of infrastructure projects. Our hope is that our two countries will maintain our close cooperation in developing future infrastructure projects in Indonesia. And such effort will boost connectivity in Indonesia and spur greater economic uh, growth as a whole. Next, I would like to answer some question from NHK and Moroccan Press News Agency in regard to issuing visa for foreigners for business purposes, opening our border, borders, and resuming our airlines. As I have addressed, uh, colleagues, uh, I think I have addressed this issue 
many times before. So I will only re-emphasize that it will depend on the development of the situation. The policies are temporary in nature and will be further evaluated in due course. And Indonesia follows closely the development in many countries who have started to make initial arrangement in allowing limited business travel that is safe from COVID-19. Indonesia had also started to discuss this issue with a number of countries. So we see this development as an initial step to start turning the wheels of the economy in a productive yet safe from COVID-19 manner toward realizing the new normal. In regard to the question by Moroccan press news agency on the latest report of COVID-19 relating to the foreign community in Indonesia, what I can convey colleagues that per yesterday, the 3rd of June, 304, 304 are positive, 26 foreign nationals have died, 201 have recovered, 481 are ODP or people under monitoring, 256 ODP foreign nationals have been repatriated, and three unconfirmed. So colleagues, that is all from me. And now I would like to give the floor again to Minister Limpo, and after that to Professor Wiku. Pak Sharul, dipersilahkan kembali. Thank you, Madam Minister. I would like to answer two questions from Mainichi Shimbun. The question is, the FAO and WHO have provided a special attention to a potential food crisis as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. What is Indonesia's reaction to this? I think this is a global crisis that have impacted almost all countries and this is becoming our concerns that we have to find a solution for to the people of Indonesia of 260 million in population. Therefore, the President has directed the Ministry of Agriculture to work with other ministries and also the private sector to take a significant role in ensuring the supply of basic foodstuffs to the people, particularly on 11 basic foodstuffs that I have mentioned earlier. I would like to convey that we have got through a very significant momentum of Ramadan and most of Indonesian Muslims and Idul Fitri as a peak season for the use of for the peak of the use of uh, foods and we have managed them well therefore in the first growing season from October 2019 through to June 2020 we have get through that well and we have a stock of rice of more than 7 million tons and concerning the warning by FAOs. What we are going to do is to fully concentrate to grow all the uh, cropped lands, all the cultivated lands from 7 million hectares that we are concentrating as uh, 5.6 million hectares and this is equivalent to 15 million tons of rice and 30 million of 
grains that will produce around 15 million of rice. But we are optimistic that that is our optimistic measures and our lower uh, expectation is 12 million. So from, so from 12 plus 17.4 of our domestic needs until December of 2020 is 15 million tons of rice. Therefore, we can carry over even our supplies to 2021 around 5 million tons. And that is if we're talking only about rice. Apart from what we have prepared on rice and other commodities, we also strengthen our diversification of foods, including sagu and also root plants, sorghum, soy, soybeans, sweet corns. And this will obviously strengthen our basic food commodities to ensure the fulfillment of domestic needs. And all these strategies that have been directed by the president, we will try to get into the marshlands in central Kalimantan that is able to be grown. And not all of the marshlands that we are going to utilize, but some of the, some of the marshlands that we can use. And that is almost 164,000 hectares, which is quite significant. Hopefully, from all the marshlands that we are going to grow, we will be expecting around 1 million rice, 1 million tons of rice. And this will, uh, this will become an addition to anticipate the uh, dry season. Based on my previous explanation, we have also prepared rice barns in each areas. We have calculated carefully to look at the, uh, the, the needs in one uh, provinces in one area to another so that we can identify the uh, domestics, the, the needs that is uh, needed to be fulfilled. And the second question, whether the Indonesian government will also carry out an export control to agricultural uh, products. We do not intend to do that. The direction from the president is that we have to export product, agricultural product and provide space to strengthen our exports, even for industries that are labor intensive. We have to maintain that and we will intervene a lot more in these areas. Therefore, all the commodities, agricultural commodities, will be continued. For instance, uh, palm oil, coffee, cocoa, and tea. We hope that we do not have any problems with that. We are not going to uh, provide an ex export restriction to that. And 11, the basic uh, food products is safe. We're not looking at creating any controls or restrictions. And the directives of the president to the ministers is to be present in ensuring the fulfillment of the domestic needs of the people so that we can have a sound economic recovery. And one of the main thing that is very significant for economic activities is food products. And everybody needs coffee or cocoa, and we, are, we have plenty of that. And therefore, we are not uh, thinking of having any export restrictions. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed colleagues and uh, correspondents, foreign correspondents, Her Excellency, Minister Ratno, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Mr. Ye uh, Shahrul Yassin Limpo, our Minister of Agriculture. 
I'm Wiku Adisa Smito, uh, delighted to be here representing the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation. The National Task Force has been on duty for three months by now, and though there is still a lot uh, to catch up with, we have made quite a progress. We have been escalating the quality uh, of the nationwide data integration to meet better credibility, uh, reliability, and also accountability. We are delighted that more and more laboratories and other relevant institutions are affiliated in our system. Indonesia is in a continuous effort in ramping up both in numbers of testing kits allotted, as well as the capacity and scale of the human resources to uh, carry out the testing procedures. This data integration is of the essence in mitigating the outbreak. For it, will determine how each municipality behaves in order to govern its populace and region in accordance with the real-time situations in the context of the uh, uh, virus uh, spreading risk. On food safety, we can only say that based on UNICEF's recent report published in the media center in uh, Gugus Tugas, or the uh, National Task Force, Indonesia was a prime example of the triple burden of malnutrition even before the COVID-19 pandemic. More than uh, 7 million children under 5 are stunted, ranking Indonesia fifth highest in the world for child stunting. More than 2 million children under 5 years of age suffer from severe wasting, which is low weight for height while another uh, 2 million are overweight or obese. Uh, nearly half of the all pregnant mothers are anemic because the food they consume lacks uh, needed vitamins and, and minerals, the micronutrients. Indonesia challenges due to this uh, triple burden are complex and likely to be exacer exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemics. The pandemic is also likely to create more burden for poorer communities that are already uh, experiencing nutrient uh, crisis. They need communal and financial support so that they can ensure nutritious food is served without getting themselves deeper into debt. The world was awfully unprepared for the pandemic, but by keeping the gears of the supply chain, moving and actively seeking cooperation to keep trade open, countries can protect the most vulnerable uh, population. That is the real reason to transition, safe, productive uh, society. I would like now to answer a question from Mainichi Sinbun. Why doesn't Indonesia release how many patients who are in critical condition from the total number of positive cases or PDP. The task force and Ministry of Health has collected uh, data related to critical cases uh, through the hospital registry. Those data are used to monitor the development of the cases and make decisions based on those data. The public information that we release is also a cornerstone of the interest of medical uh, technical services and surveillance interest. Providing the uh, information to the public is quite informative with ODP and PDP, or uh, uh, a probable and suspect, confirmed cases and case of death and cases of recovery. As of 3rd of June, there are 48,153 ODPs and 13,285 PDPs. Uh, who are still being monitored. The data was taken from 34 provinces and 418 districts and cities in the country. If you look at our website, uh, www.covid19.go.id, you can see the data. The proportion of the cases of death and recovery has also illustrated the fatality of the COVID-19 and the ability of the hospital clinical services. WHO in the current daily situation report also does not report critical PDP cases. 
The second question is from Mainichi Simbun and also Moroccan Press News Agency. Does East Java have enough bed capacity related to the increasing number of cases? What measures have been taken to contain the epidemic in East uh, Java? So the number of cases in East Java has been a national concern since there is a rapid increase of cases in the last several weeks. The local government of East Java has aggressively stopping the transmission by increasing case detection and opening emergency hospital. Also, East Java has received uh, two additional mobile PCR tests to improve testing capacity of more than 1,000 specimens. However, we observe that the spike in East Java is contributed primarily from the uh, city of Surabaya. We might want to keep in mind that while being cautiously aware of the outbreak threat, every region in East Java differs in terms of the virus uh, spread risk. So based on the report we received from the field, right now across East Java, the bed occupied incurs 38.9% of the total bed capacity that is 44,895 in numbers. While the isolation room, there are 3,708 beds occupied for COVID patients. That is 96.1% of the total isolation bed uh, capacity. In regards to this, the local government is in the effort utilizing other non-referral hospitals to ramp up uh, bed capacities across East Java. To contain uh, the epidemic, mass testing and contact tracing have been vigorously carried out. Health protocol is reinforced with the assistance from the police and armies. This week, the Minister of Health and Chief Executive of the National Task Force are paying a visit to East Java to examine the province's readiness and commitment. The third question is from Channel News Asia. What has the government done to ensure the ability of hospital to handle COVID-19 patients and possible influx of it? Since Indonesia cases of COVID-19 aren't decreasing in a significant number, we are keeping our hospital ready and prepared for treating COVID-19 patients. We are ensuring the capacity of the hospital and its resources are not running out by providing support in equipment and human resources. As Indonesia textile industry is now capable of producing its own coverall, we are making sure that all hospitals and its medical resources are having enough PPEs for clinical activities. The central government has given uh, instruction to the regional government to be focused on the health budgeting in their uh, local budgets to make sure that any improvement needed in hospital is covered. The fourth question is from Channel News Asia again. Uh, which areas specifically are allowed to adopt the new normal protocol? Is Jakarta ready? What will be exactly allowed to open on uh, Friday? The National Task Force determines uh, which area are allowed to reopen according to four risk zone categorizations, uh, red, orange, uh, yellow, and green. Each zone has its requirements to adopt new normal uh, protocols. We always coordinate and ensure the preparations of each region based on the sector of the community activities. The Jakarta, especially as the capital city, needs to be reopened in stepping up uh, stages. Therefore, it is important to ensure regional readiness and the uh, transmission of cases as the main consideration for each region in carrying out this new normal stage. The fifth uh, question is from the Moroccan Press News Agency. When will the epidemic peak be rich in Indonesia. I think I have to mention that uh, 
the geographic nature of Indonesia is such a unique and wide country. It consists of many islands and also uh, various regions. Therefore, the peak of the COVID-19 case will be different in each province and region. The people definitions of coronavirus uh, peak is one time peak of the case, which after the peak, people are expecting that the case will show decrease over time and applied uh, nationally. Eventually, this is not always the case. This illustration of notion is not entirely right. So there might be a potential second wave, of course, if we are not disciplined, which will show a spike in the number of cases. So we will not continue to talk about the peak of the case because it is this pandemic. We will never know whether there will be one, two, or more peaks during the pandemics. We prefer to discuss the trend of the case, which can be monitored frequently, daily, weekly, two weekly, etc., which everybody, the public, can access the data openly in our uh, websites. So uh, after 90 days and counting, on behalf of the Indonesia National Task Force for COVID-19, uh, we would like to thank you for the all keen attention from both the public and media towards this issue. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing a lot of changes in the daily lives of people around the world, including Indonesia. However, there are things that can be done to maintain a healthy lifestyle in these difficult times. First and foremost, everyone is encouraged to follow the World Health Organization's and governmental advice to protect against COVID-19 infection and transmission. Physical distancing and good hygiene are the best protection for yourself and others against COVID-19. Importantly, good nutrition is very important before, during, and after an infection. Infections take a toll on the body, especially when this cause fever, the body needs extra energy and nutrients. Therefore, maintaining a healthy diet is very important during the COVID-19 pandemic. While no foods or dietary supplements can prevent COVID-19 infection. Maintaining a healthy diet is an important part of supporting a strong immune uh, system. Like I said in the previous media briefings, we sustain our trust in the Latin words mensana in corpore sano, a healthy mind, a healthy body towards a healthy nation, a healthy world. Thank you very much. And I'd like to return to the Ibu Ratno. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Minister Limpo. Thank you, Professor uh, Wiku and colleagues. Thank you very much for being with us again today for the uh, press briefing. And uh, inshallah, I'll see you next week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay united. Thank you.